right, um, let's get started so it doesn't go too late. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Renato Renna, who's here to tell us about quantum definity theorems and black holes. Okay, thanks a lot. And thanks to the organizers. I'm really glad to be here. I'm, as you can see from the title, a, a quantum information theorist. And I have to say that I feel a bit lonely here because I'm probably one of the few people here just quantum information theorist and not a string theorist. But you know, in quantum information these days, what one can do is to either follow the hype and do quantum machine learning, or one can do something interesting and um, try to connect to the string theory people. By the way, is this recorded? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk specifically about um, a technique that is actually quite widely used in quantum information, in particular in quantum cryptography, the quantum definetti theorem. And I will probably spend um, the first half on explaining that because I assume this is not something that is so familiar to string series or holography um, folks. And then I will um, discuss a little bit how it's, it can be applied to get some interesting, let's say, insights on calculations that are done in the context of um, black holes. So this is work with Jin Sao Wang, who is also here. So in um, case there are questions, I think he understands all that, uh, all the calculations in much more detail than probably I do. Okay, so what is the quantum definite theorem? That's a quantum generalization of a theorem from classical probability theory which was invented actually by an Italian, Bruno Definetti. And um, in the following, when I explain the theorem, I will of course show you the quantum version. If you replace all density operators by probability distributions, you will basically get back um, a slightly extended version of what Defin Bruno Definetti had. The Def Bruno Definetti case was an asymptotic version of that particular statement. And as I said, it's something that is actually useful in particular to understand systems about which we know basically nothing. And that, of course, makes it somewhat suitable for gravity. So what's the setup? Um, think of um, a big collection of subsystems. And now for the moment, you should really think of in terms of, um, let's say, quantum information language. This means there is an underlying Hilbert space connected to each of these subsystems. So these blue circles are little subsystems that have a Hilbert space, which I, in the following, will always assume to be finite. And um, it's the same Hilbert space for all of them. So they have the same state space, these systems. Otherwise, they may be in an arbitrary state. So there may be arbitrary correlations, entanglement between them, and so on. I will also assume that there are many of these subsystems. And so I will just in the following always denote the density operator of all them together by rho S1 to S capital N. So the capital N is the initial number of subsystems we have. Now consider as, um, a sub system which consists of just selecting little n many systems where little n is much smaller than capital N at random. So the randomness here is important. So I'll I'm going to choose them at random. So what does this mean more formally? So by the way, you should think of choosing them without replacing in, in the terms of what, how probably the theorists talk about that. Of course, I, I cannot choose a quantum system twice anyway. So um, I call these S1, S2 bar, Sn bar are the selected systems. And so this green R is you should think of that as randomness. So this just tells me the position of the system. So the first system S1 bar is just one of the initial collection chosen or indicated by the index R1, which is randomly chosen between one and capital N. So this means that the state of, um, of these orange systems that I, I mean, the orange ones are the ones I pick, is basically a mixture of density operators for each concrete choice I can make. So this means, and that's important to keep in mind, I choose them at random and forget the randomness by which I've chosen. So that's what this density operator tells us. 
Okay, so there's an alternative way to describe the same. So in principle, you could forget whatever I said and think of it in a different way. You could just take the big bag of all capital N many systems and basically shake it and shuffle them around. And then the state of the system, when you, I mean, you randomize over the shuffling, so you don't know how you shuffled, you just shuffled, will be again a mixture of the initial density operators here, pi is, the, is just a, a sum um, running over all possible permutations of, this, of these positions of the systems. So I get a huge state, which is now by definition permutation invariant. Because if I now, I mean, it's by construction, if you look at this sum, if I randomize over all permutations, it's obviously permutation invariant. This will be important in the following. And now I can just say, I now select from these capital N many systems, the first small N systems. And that's equivalent to what I said before. So the randomness is just somewhere else. I need much more randomness for the second description because I shuffle the whole big bag of systems and then take the first N out. And in the other case, I just picked N at random. Okay, so that's very slow and so on, but I just wanted to make clear, there's usually some confusion about is the randomness now known or not. The important message is, the randomness is averaged over. So we don't, at the end, when we see this state, know how the systems were chosen. Now, finally, the statement of the theorem. So the Definetti theorem tells you now the following. If, um, remember, n has to be sufficiently smaller than capital N. So this will show up here in this um, little factor to the right to make sense. So it tells you the following, there exists a state of small n many systems, which is basically just a convex combination of product states of identical subspace. So this sigma with index W is just an arbitrary state of one individual subsystem. And for each W could be a different sigma, but all n subsystems are in the same state, sigma W for one component of this convex combination. So this really is the, is the, this state, which I will in the following call the definite state, a definite state, there are many, is just um, in a state in the, in the convex hull of identical product states, also called IID states in information theory in particular. Um, so by the way, states of this form, IID states are the most commonly studied states in information theory because most of the tasks we are doing, if you consider channel capacities or coding data compression, they're always analyzed under the assumptions that we have many copies of an identical state. And so here, however, we have a state which is a convex combination and that makes, will make a difference. Now the Definetti or the Definetti theorem tells you that the actual state that we constructed before by just randomly choosing some systems will be very close to a state of this form. And very close means here in terms of the so-called trace distance or the one norm in, in the density operator. And this constant basically depends on the dimension of these subsystems. So the theorem is not true for infinite dimensional subsystems. Here is basically the, uh, the dimension squared that would come in. Um, and there are even counter examples. So it's not only that the theorem cannot be proved, it's not true if, um, if this is infinite dimensional. In contrast, by the way, to the classical Definetti theorem, there it's true independent, so it's true independently of the size of the subsystems. So even if they are infinite dimensional, you still get such a bound. Now you see when, when n is sufficiently small, sorry. Yes, sure, please. Uh, anyway, ask questions. Hi. I have enough time for questions. In this. Hi. Uh, can I can you uh, comment on how this uh, result is related to Schumacher compression? To what? To, to Schumacher compression. To Schumacher compression. Uh, so in Schumacher compression, you would just basically ask if you have one state of this type, what's the minimal size to which you can compress it? And now, um, in you, in this setting, like when when you would, for example, be interested in compressing that state then the Schumacher compression result would not directly apply. You have to apply to the components of this. And because this is a quantum state and you don't generally know in which component you ha have, you would take actually the maximum over all W 
and then say you calculate the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of one of those, and then take the maximum or all W, and that gives you the compression or the amount of memory you would need to store that state. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, that's, by the way, an important point. If I did calculate the von Neumann entropy of that state, it's not the same, or this will not give you the correct answer. So if you ask what's the compression size, and you just calculate the von Neumann entropy of this definite state, you would get the wrong answer. You would get a too small result. The state would not fit in general into um, the code into that number of qubits. You would really need to calculate the full entropy of those and take the maximum. Yes. So it's a typical state I assume has many, many terms in the sum, is that right? Sorry, many? Many, many terms in the sum. The sum over W, is there many, Yes, many so this, the W is quite large. However, I will actually mention that later, but it's good you ask already now. This W um, has to be, if you scale things with N, it's sufficient that this, the, the size, the set of this is only basically um, polynomial in N. But if you ask how many bits you need to represent W, it would only be logarithmically in N. And this will be important for something I say later. So you should think of this W as something that comes from a set that is polynomial in N, which is small because later it will be important how much information is contained in W itself. And the information is, of course, usually measured in bits, so it's a logarithm of n. So, okay, the, so, so yeah. I guess a typical state normally is it takes like exponential amount of uh, coefficients, but once you did this random permutation, somehow you're projecting yes, into a subspace yes. which is much smaller. It's, yes, that's absolutely correct. And precisely, it's actually um, the exact dimension or um, size of this is the dimension of the symmetric subspace of a Hilbert space. And that's, of course, only polynomially large because of this. I mean, the permutation symmetry is just a very strong symmetry. And that allows us to reduce the information we need to represent such a state to much fewer coefficients. Yeah, thanks for the remark. Any other remark? That's maybe the, or questions, that's maybe a, the most important slide if you haven't heard before about definite because that's really the state, yes. Oh, there was, okay. I'm just curious. So when N is infinity, can I just change the sum into integration? Yes, you can, yes. Actually, the original theorem is usually was stated in terms of the integration, but it's stronger if you um, phrase it in terms of a sum, because then you know how you can have a bound on the number of terms, which will be important for us. But yes, it's true. So for an integration, yeah, you can turn it into okay. an integration. And then yes. my next question is then, is sigma, like, are they special? Are they satisfying some commutation relationship or form and algebra? No, generally not. Generally, you know nothing about sigma. So this is actually a... Um, um, so if the initial state of the big set of this back, so to speak, is arbitrary, then the sigmas can be arbitrary as well. Now there are, um, it's, it's actually a whole research program um, to find out if, for example, this big system has some additional structure. For example, you could say um, all these subsystems consist of two parts which are not entangled. Is then... So let's say the total state is such that there's no entanglement between an A part and the B part, mm -hmm. and the A B split goes through all the subsystems. And then the question is, is this still inherited by this small sigma? Are they also not entangled? And in this particular case, one can show that, but there are other properties which are not inherited by sigma. So generally, generically, you know basically nothing about those, okay. except that there are very small states because there's states on a subsystem, and that's the useful property that oh, exists. That very helpful. One more, I'll give it to you right after. Yeah. Um, is one norm very important or is like boundedness given as long as there is like this density matrices satisfy some norm? So which is, what is important? Is one norm important? Like can... The, sorry, I didn't acoustically... One norm. One norm. About the one norm. Oh yes, this is important. Thanks for bringing this up. Because um, at least for, for information series, because what we want to do is usually to, um, argue that if you have a um, some task, let's say you do quantum cryptography, and then the real state you're dealing with is this orange one, it's the one that is 
actually the one you get in reality, but we do the analysis for this much nicer definite state. And then we want to argue that after we analyzed everything and know the property for, of that, we can immediately um, apply the result to that state. And so the one norm has the property that if, if it's very small, then the error you make in any operationally relevant task, like you ask, what is the probability that an error occurs in, in a quantum cryptographic scheme or that the adversary sees a message that she shouldn't see is always bounded by this one norm. So the one norm is really the relevant norm for all what we call operational tasks, because it directly bounds the probability by which the two situations can be um, told apart. So that's why we are so interested in that. So we wouldn't be happy if this was another norm, unless we could transform it back to the one norm. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I've seen this theorem several times and I, I, I can never tell whether it's trivial or deep. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's um, like, it's not just a consequence of permutation variance, right? Because there are more permutation invariant states you could write down. Yes. So, so I see at least yeah, somehow so, the large n gets rid of those, but what are, what are we really learning from this thing? I would say it's actually, um, there's, okay. I mean, you could say it's, um, yeah. What is the definition of trivial? Let's say I could give you an example, which where it's not obvious, okay. Let's say the best example is think of the so-called totally anti-symmetric state. This is a state which um, has just um, the dimension of the subsystems has to be as large as n in order for it to be constructed. For the anti-symmetric state, the anti-symmetric state is written as a density operator, also a permutation invariant state. So it satisfies all the conditions of the theorem, but um, it maximally violates this condition actually. So for the anti-symmetric state, this is just the trace distance is one half, which is basically the maximum. So therefore you could say that the theorem tells you somehow under which conditions you don't have, you don't fall into that. Like it, it's simply not true for all states. And the theorem tells you the only condition you need is that the subsystems have sufficiently low dimension compared to N. And that's not, I would say not completely obvious because for example, classically, it's not true. Classically, as I said before, it would even work for infinite dimensional systems. So in that sense, I would say it's not completely trivial as a statement. If you judge it from the lens of the proof, then I would say there are nowadays quite simple proofs, but there are also more elaborate versions because for quantum information purposes, this bound is not good enough. You want something that is scaling exponentially in N. So something like E to the minus N and that you can achieve. And these proofs are much more, these theorems are much more involved. They are not there, I would say they're certainly not far from trivial and they have to make a compromise in, in this, on this side because that's basically tight what I wrote down. So the non-trivial statements tell you, tell you philosophically, this is still true, even if you go exponentially um, fast down to zero. So that are new versions of that. So yeah, there's a whole variety of statements which I think are not obvious. So in that sense, it's, I would I mean, say it's not I've, somehow, I've heard probabilists, I mean, probabilists seem to assign great importance to this theorem. Mm -hmm. Like they say things like, oh, if it weren't for this theorem, we could never learn anything. Yes. I, I, and I, yeah, it, it doesn't look that, yeah. I mean, I don't see that statement. Coming out of okay, I think the, the reason why you're saying that is um, if you, for example, I mean, you can say what I presented before as an introduction, like you choose these random systems. It's basically the way we do science, we take samples. And now you can say, what justifies to do the usual analysis we do in science? We usually assume that the samples are independent of each other. If I do an experiment at CERN, I assume that each collision is independent of the other collisions. But now if you are really a, um, like a paranoid, person as people are who do quantum cryptography like me then you would say who tells you that this is really independent and then you want to have a justification which you can give without imposing further assumptions now you see a random selection the only assumption i'm making is now that the randomness i put in to do the selection is good randomness which is still an assumption but at least it's something i can somewhat influence and then i have a guarantee that i have the correct distribution so in that sense one could say 
probably what probability theorists mean. This is really the basis of doing science, because if we didn't have that theorem, we could never do science because we wouldn't have independent samples of whatever, whatever we want to investigate. Now, in you could say that's a paranoid view, but in quantum cryptography, that's precisely what we need, because there we have an adversary who tries to mislead us. So we better apply methods which don't rely on any assumption that we cannot directly verify, and you can never verify whether there are hidden correlations between two experiments. They could always be arranged in such a way that you don't see it. This theorem just tells you they are not there at the end. So in that sense, I would say it's, it is important. So in terms of its importance, it's definitely not trivial. And Yes, right. And I will, you will see in the application that the conspiracy may even occur in black holes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, one 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 little question. Yes. Uh, the on the formula that was just on the slide that we're looking at the P's and the the and the statement of the theorem. Yes. Uh, the uh, when I go from n to n plus one or n plus two, uh, am I understanding that the P's and the sigmas are staying fixed or? Um, so yeah, it depends a bit what you want um, to keep fixed. You can say that. Um, so, okay, the way I was now, I will use it in the following is that um, if, of course, you increased, for example, the capital N, uh -huh. then you would, of course, this bound should become better and better. And it can only become better if you also in increase the number of terms W here. I, I but was, uh -huh. in principle, what you can do is you can actually fix. So there is one choice. What, I mean, that's the, maybe an important strengthening of how I phrased it. There is one choice of Ws, but then you have to integrate. So you take like an infinite set of Ws, and then um, this expression is true for that fixed choice for any small n and capital N. So in a sense, you have different choices of what you fix, but that's one choice. So if you're not interested in keeping the number of terms here small, but are happy with even an integration over a continuous set, then you can just fix that thing once and for all, and that, that statement below is true. That means fixing the state sigma w once and for all. Pardon? That means fixing the state sigma w once and for all. Yes, you basically fix the family sigma w, and you fix the weights pw, yes. Which, of course, in the continuous case, is just an integration measure over the space of states on one subsystem. Yes. OK, so then I think the theorem Sorry. should be one yeah. last oh okay. yeah it, it, the, you said the constant scales like the dimension the dimension square the local dimension the local dimension square yes of course importantly yes thanks for pointing this out otherwise it would be quite a useless theorem okay now i need to tell you one thing about the um let's say en entropy calculated for such a definite state and um Okay, this blue box is just to remind those who are not familiar with conditional entropy and mutual information how these were defined. But basically, the statement on this slide is the following. So, if you look at now a definite state, so a state of the form we just discussed, and you're now asking what's the joint entropy of n systems normalized with n, then you can um, do the following. You can here, you see what I did when I wrote down this state, I put an additional system, an ancilla system that keeps the information what W is. And so I can now also include in my entropic expression the W. And now the, um, what basic calculations in information theory, just the basic, basically the definitions of this quantity tell you is that if I'm interested in the choice, so H by the way is here the von Neumann entropy. I didn't use S for obvious reasons for the von Neumann entropy because the system is already S. So that's the joint entropy of all N systems. Um, I can write this as the joint entropy of all the systems conditioned on this W plus some correction term, which is given in terms of a mutual information. Now comes the point where it's relevant how many Ws I have, that was your question. And because I have only polynomially many, the information stored in this W is only logarithmic in N basically. So I have here this whole term, this can be bounded by the entropy of W. And so this will give me a, a contribution, which is basically one over N up to logarithm. So in other words, the, this entropy here, this averaged, ent so that's, you can interpret it as the average von Neumann entropy in that sense. So you, the joint, 
the entropy per piece is in the interval here given by this and that. So it's basically as large as the entropy of one system conditioned on W. So this is again saying the same. So that's the statement I just made. And now we can introduce a quantity which I just define, or I mean, it is defined. It's, wide, it's relatively widely used in information theory. It's called the regularized entropy. And that's just what I just said before. It's a joint entropy of N systems divided by N and you, in the limit where you have many such systems. So we can define this. And now what this argument that I made before, this thing here tells you is that in this limit, um, it's just equal to this conditional entropy. So the conditional entropy of one system conditioned on W is the same as this so-called regularized entropy. This is something that will be important later. So you should somehow try to remember that, that regularized entropy is equal to the conditional entropy. And now is the second part of my talk. I will now try to apply the statements that I've made to calculations of the page curve. Basically. So that's now, I will now switch gears and move into a regime where um, it's maybe um, clearer why you should care about this theory. Uh, sorry, could you go back like one or two slides on the definition of the, um, or sorry, right before the regularized entropy? Yeah, this one. Good. This so, one, yes. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just maybe missed, it went a little bit quick, like the introduction of this W uh, ancilla. Yes. Like what, how did you know to put that in as like an ingredient for calculating this um, like kind of average entropy of the S mm -hmm. like. So the question is how I put that in or why or. Yeah, like how, wh why. Why, uh, okay. Like how does that it's affect It's basically, this? you can see it as a, um, just a technical thing that will be useful later that I can say, I mean, this, actually I'm interested in this entropy that has a meaning. It's really the joint entropy of all the systems. Right. That's something I want to know. And now I want to somehow, um, instead, I mean, this is a huge system I would need to write down. It's exponentially large in N. So the point is basically, if I want to calculate this quantity um, in a simple way, then I better get an expression that only involves one subsystem. And now it turns out that if I introduce this W as an ancilla system, what I get is indeed a formula that allows me to calculate this complicated object in terms of size, in terms of an object that information theorists would call a single letter formula. So I pay the price of introducing one more object, but get a single letter formula back that doesn't depend on N. That was the reason. That makes sense. Yes, right, yes. You can, that's very intuitive because the double condition on W, you have basically a product state. And that's, I mean, what this, what this argument exploited here. Sorry, I mean, just I didn't go through it, but this equality is just basically saying if you have here um, a condition on W, then it's additive. So instead of writing one over N times this, I can also just write the entropy of one subsystem. So I jumped over that, but that is the only, step that is needed so that's really a trivial argument Sorry, once you just one one more question yes. about that so this conditioning on w does it mean that you 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 measure w and you then know that and then you know what is the state yes if you w? you can think of this i mean later we will not need any i mean at the end the w will again disappear in the application it's just a temporary thing but if you wanted to like if you had access to it you could measure it and then that would be the entropy of the system conditioned on the knowledge of W. Yes, that's absolutely right. Okay. Now let's move into the application. So um, I will apply this um, basically to revisit the replica trick that was of course widely used in calculations in famous calculations by some people who are here. And yeah, the application is really about revisiting that trick and trying to understand what is really the entropy that is calculated. Because if inf quantum information series can express one complaint about this community is that sometimes people are a bit careless about what are the different entropies. You have already seen, we have the regularized entropy, the von Neumann entropy and so on. And we always try to keep track of them and that may make a difference. That's basically the message of what's coming now. But let's briefly um, see why. So here I just um, use, this notation that HN is the Rennie entropy of order N and I wrote an N um, despite the fact of course that this N is now 
a real number, but um, as you know, to calculate it, we just, it's sufficient to consider Renyi entropies of um, n, an entire number larger than one. And we have this formula that we can, in the case where n is a natural number, express in this form here. So that's the replica trick. And I think the important point from a conceptual viewpoint about replica trick, it, it turns the calculation of the entropy into the calculation of an observable. And the observable is this so-called um, cyclic shift operator, which is now an observable on n systems. So it's really not an observable on one system, which of course makes sense. I can never measure the entropy if I only have one copy of a system. I need many copies. And that's why this really also makes sense apart from its ma purely mathematical um, uh, correctness, so to speak. Now, what's the, let's say this is maybe the most important slide to understand why we are even like potentially interested in using or in revisiting this and, and saying something. So the replica trick <clears throat> is again written here. So that was the thing. And you see the important thing is that we now have these N replicas of the state. Now we use Usually what, what people are doing is they use a gravitational path integral to calculate this observable. They, this is, as I said, an expectation value. So the path integral is a perfect means to calculate this expectation value. And then you could say, okay, then we are happy. We have this expectation value. Therefore we can get this and then analytically continue to one and we are done. However, note that when we do that in gravitational path integrals, we never talk about really this state. This is just implicit and the replica trick really assumes that this is actually a product state. So if you use a, um, a calculation, we should also make sure that the implicit state that appears in this calculation is actually still of product form, because otherwise the replica trick is just not correctly applied. It requires that there is a product form. So when we do a path integral, despite the fact that the boundary conditions are in product form, we have a priori not a guarantee that this implicit state is actually of product form. And actually it's, one could say it's not because it's the whole point of the calculation to show that there are correlations in it. Yes. I'm almost sure this is just a notational issue, but uh, you don't mean to say that we have any confusion about the boundary state being in product form. You're just talking no, about the yes. state that we use. Yes. yes, I'm talking about the bulk state, yes. Maybe the pic I have a picture for that. So yeah. what I mean is, we have the boundaries. Okay, th this is just the boundary state, let's say of some infalling matter shell. That's clearly of product form. And now what I'm saying is that the inside, of course, okay, in, th in this case, the inside is somehow not product. And therefore there's also not a guarantee that the radiation, which is of course somehow coupled to the whole system will be in a product state. So presumably this is, this is gonna have some overlap or some relation to the work of, of Akers and Pennington. Yes, I mean, that this is exactly what happens in some incompressible state scenarios. Or... Yes, okay, maybe we, we need to discuss that later because I'm not. The least one -shot entropies appear, so oh, the, the fact that the one shot entropies yeah. appear. Yes, and okay, maybe we move that to the because I think this problem arises independently of the use of one shot entropies, actually. So, yes, that's another issue, but I think this is, and what I want to point out now is a different aspect that is not directly connected to the one-shot entropies. So the point is just, we, there's no reason a priori to believe that this state, so now I, I write it more generally, what the replica trick does, it calculates this. But now this equality that we had before is no longer valid in general, because we, unless we somehow certify that this state has product form, but it doesn't usually, so we shouldn't hope to be able to certify that this has product form because the whole, I mean, I understand from the calculations, the whole point was it has not, but if it has not, we cannot go back and say what was actually calculated is the, is the Rennie entropy. And that's of course a, a seemingly a problem because the whole point was to calculate the Rennie entropy. But now the Definetti theorem comes in and um, explains in a certain sense from a different perspective what's going on. So, okay, the, the point here is this is not true. However, what we can now do is 
as a preparation, just say, let's just not care about the fact that the replica trick doesn't work and define a new entropy, which is just by definition, whatever happens if I take this quantity and don't care about the fact that this is not of product form. And I still, I mean, this is exactly the expression I had before. And um, I just give it a new name because that doesn't have product form. And I still take the limit where n goes to one, I analytically continue. And then I get something that I call the swap entropy. So that's now a different entropy. So the point of the previous slide is the swap entropy I just defined is not equal to the von Neumann entropy in general. I'm so sorry, I, yeah. I'm just being really slow about this. You're, you're writing this as if it was a boundary state. Uh -huh. No, it's not supposed to be a boundary state. But so, if it's a bulk state, then that's not how we compute the entropy. So I'm confused by the log of, uh -huh. of something. Yes, so appears. the point is, okay, the point I want to make is, yeah, okay, thanks for bringing this up. So what I write down here, or let's say in this expression, is supposed to be, so if we had a bulk picture, this would be what we would write down where rho is the bulk state. Now, of course, we cannot work in the bulk because we don't have the bulk um, Hilbert space. So I just, let's say the reason is as following. Let's suppose someone has figured out what the bulk Hilbert space is. Let's say you take some tensor network model and do it there or whatever. Then we would really have this expression where every, all the, so, all that, by the way, all I write down are always bulk states. But, but I and, mean, in the, from the bulk point of view, there's always going to be some sort of area contribution, well, at least generically, uh -huh. which will never be of this product form. So I'm, or, I mean, I yes, can, it I will can understand how there's yes. a bulk matter entropy. You can think of it as computing some Rennie entropies and yes. taking that limit, but. But, but we want to, yeah. let's say, if I just think a priori of the, let's suppose I had a bulk theory. And I don't even think of a boundary. So I just have the bulk theory. Then clearly that's, that's the expression I want to calculate. So if I didn't even know about, let's say, the fact that there is some boundary as well. So I just, this is what I want to do. Now, um, we don't have that, but we, we still know that whatever is here is an expectation value of an observable. But now only in this blue part, we now make the connections. I mean, now we have methods to calculate that. So basically what well, the, the argument I'm trying to say is that this is what we wanted if we knew the bound, if we had the bulk picture, but we don't have it, but we can still say that what we calculate is an expectation value. Now, of course, I'm, the whole point I'm making is if we think of it in that way, this expectation value, there's no guarantee that this is in a product state. So I'm, I'm not saying it should be in a product state, but I'm saying this is still an observable, which we can now, using the techniques like gravitational path integrals calculate, and then we go to the boundary. So we go to the boundary when in this, let's say, blue thing in the calculation of that, which I didn't write down. I just, this is only in this text where I say, how do people calculate that? They use the boundary and, and the gravitational path integral. I'm not sure this fully clarifies it, but maybe, yeah. I feel like you're, you're somehow getting at this issue of non-factorization, right? That the, yes. you know, that, partition functions don't factorize and mm -hmm. right. yes so so you're, you're yeah you're somehow trying to give us some interpretation of that right? not necessarily so i'm just saying let's okay maybe i shouldn't have written okay so why did i write down here a product state the reason why there is a product state is if i want to claim that i calculate um the von neumann entropy or yeah, if I claim that what I actually calculate is a von Neumann entropy of the bulk, then it should have been a product state. Yeah, it should. But it we, is. It should it, have been. It but now it's not one. Of, of course, uh, the whole yeah. point is it is yeah, not a the, product state. In the state. calculation that we actually mm -hmm. do, right? So in the calculation we actually do, there, it's not mm -hmm. a product state, but it's not a state at all, right? We're just. It's not a state at all. Yes, right. But it's certainly not a product state if it was well, one. In, right. Yes. In particular, it's not a product yes. state, but it's not any state at all. Yes. But my some, point is that if you, if you now want to interpret <laughs> and say, okay, what you're calculating is this this thing here, what I call later the, the swap entropy. Uh -huh. Now the question is, is it justified to say that this entropy we calculated corresponds indeed to a, an entropy in the bulk? And uh -huh. this would only be justified if the replica trick could be interpreted as a trick that works in the bulk. Yeah. That's maybe the... 
I mean, I, I somehow thought that you were somehow trying to say that something along the lines of what Merrill and Maxfeld would say, where they would mm -hmm. say that you have an average over alpha states. And I thought that that was yes, that will, your average. Maybe I proceed states. and then we can really, because it will indeed have a connection to that. Yes. There, there was a question online. Mm -hmm. There was a chat uh -huh. question. I don't know. There's a question on the chat. It. Okay. So how do I? Uh, yeah. Okay, what happens if you do this calculation in the boundary theory? Is it always possible to construct the product state in the boundary, but not in the bulk? So I, I think this is the same question. So, yeah, so again, I think the point is I start from a complete bulk picture. And then I say, okay, one can regard what people do in the boundary just as a technique to say something about the bulk because we cannot directly do anything in the bulk because we don't know how the Hilbert space looks like. That's basically the second. So, You're trying to find exactly how the gravity path integral lies to us. I think that's what, I yeah, how, what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah, how it lies to us, but it, it gets the right answer, but you're saying it lies to us. And yeah. I think you're trying to yes. So I would say what we shouldn't do. So maybe one could phrase it as a criticism. What we shouldn't do is to say that, okay, we calculate you gravitational path integrals calculate this quantity. Now this quantity, we want to say this has a meaning also in the bulk, but for it to have a meaning in the bulk, it would be necessary to say that we can now go back in this direction and say it indeed corresponds to an entropy in the bulk. So I'm not saying anything about like this should have a product form because of the calculation. I'm saying if we want at the end to go here and talk about an entropy in the bulk, at least at that point, we would need to know that this has product form because otherwise we don't, don't get across this equality. So that's maybe, so the point is only about the technique. So we, if we want to interpret the calculation as a calculation of the von Neumann entropy in the bulk, then I'm saying we cannot do that because it's not the product state. Okay. So now I just define, I say, okay, whatever is calculated, I call this the swap entropy. And this does not assume any product structure at all. That's now the point. So now everyone should be happy because I don't, assume anything, I just say, this is whatever is calculated by the gravitational path integral. But now, um, if we knew that the state that we, that is not explicit again, so this bulk state that we don't know anything about, that's why I refer to cryptography at the beginning, we really know nothing about it, we don't even know what the Hilbert space is, but um, if we know nothing, if we knew that it had this definite structure, then we could actually figure out what the swap entropy is. So we just have to reanalyze the replica trick. And we did that, and I don't show the proof of that, but it's quite simple. Then what you find, it's just, again, this conditional entropy conditioned on W, which is what one would probably expect. And this relates to these alpha entropies because you can basically interpret the W as the alpha para or yeah, information that is in these alpha states somehow. So, okay, what's now? The point. So I have now defined an entropy, which is just defined by what people like Amit calculated. So this is just by definition what they calculated. And now I'm saying, if it had this form, if the state we don't know about had this form, we would be able to show that this quantity corresponds to this conditional entropy. But before I said this conditional entropy corresponds to what I call the regularized entropy. So it's actually equal to that. So in other words, what is actually calculated by these guys is equal to the um, regularized entropy under the assumption that the state had this Definetti structure. And now comes, of course, the Definetti theorem, which tells us indeed, we can assume it has this Definetti structure. So for that, we just need to convince ourselves that um, in, in contrast to um, the independence, the permutation invariance is something that goes into the bulk. So of course, from boundary independence, we cannot conclude in any way that the bulk has this product structure. But if the boundary is permutation invariant, which it is because it's product form, um, we can say that we can, without loss of channel generality, assume or apply another permutation to the boundary and it wouldn't change anything. 
But if we apply a um, permutational boundary and it doesn't change anything, the same must be true for the bulk because the whole bulk is defined by the boundary. So in other words, the bulk, even if it's not of product form, is certainly permutation invariant in that sense. So this means we can actually apply the definite theorem and say that this unknown state that is in the middle, in the bulk somewhere of the radiation is of that form sufficiently close. And here comes the one distance in because it's the one distance, the entropy is continuous and so on. So you can basically say the entropy of the actual bulk state is the same as if it was the entropy of a hypothetical definite state. So therefore we can apply everything I said before to an arbitrary state, bulk state and say, what people calculated, the swap entropy, is actually equal to this regularized entropy. And here is something maybe remarkable about the end. So note that the swap entropy, the actual calculations, are in the limit in the analytic continuation where n goes to one, so you have only one black hole. Whereas the regularized entropy is the opposite limit. It's the limit where you have many black holes that you somehow generate with identical boundary conditions, and you look at the joint entropy of the radiation of all of them. So the statement is what, what was actually calculated is the regularized entropy. That's basically the Sorry, I, I, conclusion. I, so now that you're applying the theorem, uh, mm -hmm. what, what is capital N? Capital N. In the black hole discussion. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I saw only little N. So now I had on, yes. So capital N. this basically go, okay, I, I didn't now go in, to that. So once you are here, because, okay, you can, by a separate argument, say that the entropy is quite robust once you have many subsystems. So once I can go here to a large N, if I now go from little N to capital N, this will not change anything. So. Oh, so you say that if little n is big, then it's not so important because in the theorem, yes, in before opinion, I said theorem, little n has little to, n yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah. Before I said little n has to be much smaller than capital N. Yeah. Now, um, actually, thanks to your question about the triviality, I also mentioned that there are stronger theorems where the n, um, actually, where it is, is an exponential trade off, and there the n can be as large as n. So that's one way to see that. There is even other arguments in the case of entropy because entropy just has sufficiently nice properties. Once you know it for a sufficiently large number, so the regularized entropy doesn't suddenly change. So if you have, let's say, what you can show is that this converges already for reasonably large n and doesn't change once you suddenly go to capital N. So yeah, thanks for remarking this, but this, is now really in the limit where n is arbitrarily large in a sense. Uh -huh. But if we wanted to understand little n equals two or something, then that would not tell us not anything. No, no. I think so. So n has to be actually very large. So maybe it's the opposite. So n has to be probably larger than the number of microstates of the black hole. So it really has to be large. <laughs> So I'm not saying this is something to do a practical experiment to create all these black holes and then. <laughs> Uh, maybe I missed something, but wasn't this the case that you, uh, the theorem is not true for large capital N? Oh, so I think it is at the end. So this, so what, what I was now saying at the end is that, okay, what I showed kind of is here for the small n, assuming that there's an even larger capital N number of black holes from which I selected them at random. Now by an additional argument, one can get rid of that and say this, small n can really be capital N. And so I don't need to worry about the difference. Oh, oh no, I, I mean like you can't have really large capital N for the definite theorem to like work. Oh, for the definite theorem, capital N can be arbitrarily large. So the only condition on the definite theorem was, you know, in this um, statement, the distance is the fraction between small n and capital N. So we just have to a priori ensure that small n is sufficiently smaller than capital oh. N and capital N you can, you can even think of capital N as the number of black holes you could potentially generate, but don't. Because that's how people think in experiments, like when they do a random choice, like at CERN, the reason why the definite theorem applies, if you're paranoid, is that you could have done many more experiments at CERN, which you didn't do because you randomly selected when you did them. Okay. So it's in a sense. And this is, is there something about the dimensionality of the open spaces of these black holes that can't be too large? 
Yeah, so the, the dimensionality of the Hilbert space shouldn't grow with n the, of the individual Hilbert spaces. So what I assume here is that the black holes have a fixed size and then I let n go to infinity. But you can even be more precise and say, as I said, if this n is larger than the dimension of the individual black holes, then it also works. So this can be made explicit, this leap. I mean, we know all the constants here. I just wrote it down for simplicity in, in this form. Okay, so that's basically the preliminary conclusion. I don't know whether I still have two or three minutes to give the final conclusion. <laughs> yeah, you got five minutes. Okay, there was a question. I, I had one question. So earlier you said that the number of W's you could show only needed to be logarithmic. Yes. In little n. Yes. For these upgraded theorems where you can prove an exponentially small difference between the It's also theorems, like that, logarithm. yes, yes. The reason is again that the symmetric subspace is sufficiently small. That's a technical reason, but yes, that's true. Yes. Okay, so now maybe I skip. Okay, this is just to say that of course it can be the case that the regularized entropy is smaller than the von Neumann entropy because if you would think of two black holes that would radiate and are somehow correlated, then if the radiation is correlated, then the joint entropy of the radiation is of course smaller than the sum of the entropies of the individual radiation fields. And the difference by the way, is the so-called mutual information between the two radiations. So if the radiation of two black holes is correlated, then the regularized entropy, which is of course not only for two, but for more um, in the limit will be smaller. So that's again, this preliminary conclusion and the important point is this regularized entropy so this is what was calculated in the replica trick in the limit where n goes to one is equal to the regularized entropy which talks about many black holes so that is really the claim is that's actually the thing that people calculated i hope they would somewhat agree that this is what they calculated and this is not the von neumann entropy in general of course there may be additional arguments that it is but a priori generically it's not so this means that when we draw this curve in principle we could say um if one now i mean this is not a claim that it is like that it's just from what i now said it's not clear that there is actually a contradiction between hawking's calculation and the, the new calculations because one could argue maybe hawking still calculated the von neumann entropy and the new calculations give the regularized entropy and therefore because the von Neumann entropy as I just argued can be larger than the regularized entropy there is a, strictly speaking not a contradiction so we just have to realize there are actually two different entropies that's why I said at the beginning sometime that it's important to really be clear about what are the entropies exactly now um, okay let me just make one final comment so if I think of this typical experiment where I collapse a matter shell and let it evaporate like I mean the one that underlies this page curve more or less um, I could do some like I have a, a very maybe naive and um, yeah from a maybe quantum information type um, model where it happens that these two quantities are really different and I would just want to conclude with that so let's suppose that the matter shell that collapses has no um, direction, that no directionality. There, let's suppose it's, it's made of particles which have no direction themselves. And then let's suppose that when the black hole coll um, collapses and radiates, the radiation, like the quantum field theory is such that most of the radiation are spin zero particles which have no direction, but maybe there's just, the energy is arranged in such a way that maybe there are certain more high energy particles which have spin one half, so they have a direction. So we could now assume that we start in a universe where there was never ever a directed particle. We just had this matter shell, but then once we, we let it collapse and the black hole um, evaporates, we suddenly see the first spin one half particle that was ever seen in the universe. Now, why am I... Um, looking at this so I call this by the way the elusive reference model because the point is that when we have a universe without anything that has a direction and we would for the first time see a spin one half particle then its direction looks completely random of course it's not really random in the sense that someone randomized it and I remember that Daniel said it's there are these strange people who think that a black hole actually randomizes things but now this is basically how I would think of this randomness that it just generates something for which I have no reference. 
And if I have no reference, then it looks random to me. So it looks as if it was randomized. So now in this model, it would indeed happen that the von Neumann entropy, so if I now do that with n black holes, so this is the, um, the model where I do this shell collapsing and evaporation experiment for many black holes at the same time, symmetrically. And so each black hole emits one of these spin particles. So it's just arranged in such a way. And if I look at one single black hole and I don't see the other ones, then clearly each of these has just entropy of one spin. So it's one because the direction is random. If I look, but because of the symmetry, all spin directions will be identical. So once I've seen one spin of one black hole, I know the other spins are identically oriented. So the total entropy of all spin particles that were emitted by all black holes is actually still just one, which means that the regularized entropy where I normalize everything by N is zero, whereas the von Neumann entropy is one. So this is just an example where it naturally appears that the von Neumann entropy is actually larger than the um, regularized entropy without an active randomization. And so the model in an information theoretic language is just this. It looks like um, you have identical unitaries parameterized by this W and the W could be taken from some coherent state. And um, so you see the total thing is somehow a unitary, but if you don't have access to the W because this is this reference that is missing in the example before, it looks random. So this is just the quantum information description of the example I gave before, where again, you would have this feature that the von Neumann entropy of the radiation is strictly larger than the regularized entropy. Okay, so now the final conclusion. One conclusion is a general one because as I said, I feel a bit lonely as an information theorist here. So I want to make some promotion that I can also maybe attend future conferences. It's really nice here. I, I like the people. Um, it's a very friendly community. And so I think information theory has of course delivered some tools which may have been useful like the information recovery with text maps, error correction. Of course, um, I don't need to say that in this audience, but maybe there is also, it could be that other tools um, like the quantum definite theorem are going to be useful. And I try to sketch such an application. The other conclusion is that um, we should really be careful about what are the entropies we are calculating because here, um, the um, like, yeah, it can make a difference potentially. And I'm again, I'm not claiming they are different in reality, but we also don't know they are not. And I gave an example of a model, of a toy model where they would be different. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, well, we have some time for yeah. questions. Anyway, thanks for the many questions that came already. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. Thanks. I, I would interpret your theorem a little bit differently. I, I okay. would say that you proved that even when you include these replica wormholes and so forth, that uh, the resulting density matrices are still in some sense very close to uh, the form that, you, that is implied by the, the, the theorem that you said, that it's very close to sigma to the n. So it's true mm -hmm. that if you compute, for example, rho ij, rho kl, rho mn in gravity, mm -hmm. that you don't get a factorized answer. But I think what your theorem tells us is that it's sort of good enough, that it's very close to a, yeah, but you mean it's just one product or a convex combination or uh, well, potentially a convex combination yes. as mm -hmm. uh, you said. Yeah. So in some sense, I think you're saying that, yeah, gravity could lie to us, but by a very small amount. Uh, that's how I would. Sorry, the, the, that what? gravity can lie to us, but by a very small amount. I, I think that's what your theorem. Yes, in a, yes. I guess that was more a remark than a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I'm yes, sure yes, that's yeah. right, but that feels like yes, actually, yes, no, that, that that's absolutely right. And actually, part of the motivation to derive to go in this direction came from these papers. I should have acknowledged that that's definitely the case. Yeah. Uh, it's basically a quantum information version of, of these things, like, like you could say, of, of these baby universes and so on. So, this is basically. W, the definite theorem gives you that from other assumptions, but it coincides in a sense. Yes. So you said we should be careful about what entropies we're calculating and yes. so on and so forth. From the 
black hole information paradox perspective, mm -hmm. what kind of entropy, like what, I don't know if there is a definite answer, but what is your intuition as to what kind of entropy we should calculate? Is, is there One a physical, should calculate. physical okay. sort of reason? Yes, I, I think I have some, um, I think the operationally relevant entropy is actually the ones um, that was calculated. So I would say if you ask an information series beforehand, should we calculate the von Neumann entropy of a black hole or the regularized entropy? Then clearly, um, and at least one, someone who thinks operationally, which quantum information series usually do, should have answered, you should calculate the regularized entropy because that's the only thing you could potentially measure. So if you ask, what, what is the thing we could determine, verify by an experiment, it is the regularized entropy and not the von Neumann entropy. So in that sense, they calculated exactly the right thing. And it also makes sense because the calculation is somehow operational in a certain sense. Yeah, yeah. I meant yes. from an in yes. so I, theory. I think this is the answer. The von Neumann entropy here is the wrong quantity from an operational perspective. You can never verify by an experiment. Sorry, do you have do you have a proposal for how Ahmed can calculate the von Neumann entropy? <laughs> no, it just said what, the other, what he calculated is the right thing. So why should he do it? <laughs> yeah. No, I I, I think um, that's maybe something that um, would, I mean that's an extremely interesting question. I would love I had an answer. Actually, Jin Zhao Wang um, has also thought more about that. Maybe we can discuss it with him later. Are there further questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Renato again. Yeah, thank you.